Chanel, Her Lifestyle and Life, 1998, and The Richest Woman in America, Hedy Green in the Gilded Age, from 2012. She also co-authored Arafat, <clears throat> In the Eyes of the Beholder, a biography of Yasser Arafat, The New Palestinians, a look at the leading figures in the West Bank and Gaza, and Still Small Voices, the personal stories of 10 Israelis and Palestinians during the first intifada. As a contributor to the Washington Post magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, and other periodicals, Janet Wallach has written cover stories of Queen Noor of Jordan, First Lady of Egypt, Jihan Sadat, and Iraqi Ambassador Nizar Hamdoun. She has taught at Bradford College, Earlham College, and others. And she's the founding director and president emeritus of Seeds of Peace, a nonprofit and educational and leadership training program. Seeds of Peace brings together outstanding teenagers from regions in conflict, including Israelis and Arabs, Indians and Pakistanis, and Americans of diverse backgrounds. Janet, welcome to the church. Thank you. That was lovely. <laughs> We're thrilled to have you here to talk about flirting with danger, the mysterious life of Marguerite Harrison, socialite spy. I'm going to open with just a little paragraph from the New York Times rave review from last week, which gives just a hint at how adventurous Marguerite's life was. So the review began, anyone complaining about a canceled Delta flight would do well to channel Marguerite Harrison. The United States' first international female spy, Harrison crisscrossed the globe by rickshaw, propeller plane, camel, inflated goatskin raft, and rail freight car, and once brightly described a trans-Siberian voyage in which she was wedged between sacks of tea and oats on the back of a troika in a blizzard, as a rare and delightful experience. <laughs> so Janet, who was Marguerite Harrison? Marguerite Harrison was a daughter of the Gilded Age. She was born in 1878, not long after the Civil War, and um, lived the life of a society woman in Baltimore until her widowed her husband died at a young age and left her with a son, a teenage son. And she decided not to go back to her family, which was the typical thing to do, but to apply for a job with the Baltimore Sun as a, an assistant editor of society life. During World War I, she became an, a reporter and then decided she wanted to be a spy. So a little bit of taste of who she was. She was beautiful, she was brilliant, fluent in at least five languages, with a good sense of humor, and a absolute almost mania for adventure and, and, a, and a healthy dose of curiosity. So what impact did her husband's unexpected death have on her when she was just 37? Because it sounds like her life just turned on a dime. It did turn on a dime. She was madly in love with him, and they had a very warm and caring marriage. Uh, and she had really poured her emotions into her love for him and for her son. And when he died, she was so stunned and taken aback, really, by, by the, the whole experience that she withdrew her emotions. She really pushed them down and vowed that she would not get emotionally involved with anyone again, including her son. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, in fact, I, you know, she, I was going to ask you about her son a little later, but I'm going to, I'll ask you about it now. Um, you know, she spent years away from him um, uh, when she was in Europe and uh, the, the East, um, years in which she could have easily died given the, her taste for adventure, um, and, her, and his father had already died. Um, but you describe them as very close. How do you jive the one with the other? Yeah. <laughs> And what did he think of her life? I think they were close in the sense that they understood one another. Uh, not so close emotionally. 
because she just could never let herself be that way. And that was, that was very painful uh, for him. It was. It, had a, it, it did not have a, a good impact on, on him. Um. So um, after she signed up to be a, a social columnist or writer, um, she then also marched herself into first the Navy and then the Army to um, sign up to be a spy. Um, how is she just said, I'm here, put me to work? Is that, was that what happened? Well, she applied. She, she, she was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and she filled out an application for Navy, naval intelligence and sent it in, and they looked at it, and the head of intelligence said, a woman? <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance that we're going to accept you into intelligence. So she applied to the Army, and it was a new division for the Army. They had not had an intelligence division before that. Uh, and they sent somebody to interview her. And this man read her application and was fluent in languages himself. And one of the first questions he asked her after talking with her for a while was, how come you're so, your German is so good? This was World War I. How come your German is so good? How, did you live in Germany for a long time? And she said, I never lived in Germany. I'm an eighth generation American on both sides. But she had a fantastic ability to learn languages. And she said, my French is equally good, and my Italian and Spanish are almost as good. And she could pass for a native, which was very appealing when you, you know, during the war. And so she was hired right away in 1918. So where did she land first in Europe, and, and what did she do when she got there? Marguerite was sent to Germany, the first, Amer the first American woman that many Germans had seen in, in a very long time. And as, as you said, Deanie, um, the only American woman sent overseas. She, her assignment was we, what, what happened was she was hired in 1918 and, and the idea was to send her to Germany. Not long after she was hired, the Germans asked for an armistice. So when her phone rang, she was sure they were calling to say, forget about the job, that's the end of that. But instead, the Germans, the Americans wanted to know what was going on in Germany. We were going to Paris for peace talks. We knew we'd be asking for reparations, as would the other allies, and certain demands in terms of military, military-wise. So we needed information on what was going on in Germany. Nobody had been there. The, the war was in France and Belgium. The fighting was not in Germany. So we really had very little information politically, economically, socially, psychologically. What was happening? Who was in charge? How did the people feel? Uh, and so her job was to find out everything that she could about life in Germany. And so that meant sort of a certain way of living by day, and then by night she was also this glamoring, dashing figure, dining out with the with German society, and she was also, um, she adopted personas, right? To, she pretended to be different people sometimes. Well, she was the uh, special correspondent for the Baltimore Sun. That was her cover. And so that, and that was a job, I mean, you know, so she was doing that, but she she arrived with uh, a list of contacts and letters of introduction to different people. And there was serious fighting going on in Berlin and other places between the socialists on the left and the monarchists on the right. And she had to befriend both sides, as well as the social democrats in the center. And so one of the first 
people that she met there w was a woman who, who, who she had been given a letter of introduction to. It, she was, the woman was a Philadelphia socialite married to a German aristocrat who was one of the leading generals in World War I, highly respected not only by the Germans, but by the Allies as well. And she went to have tea with them. They invited her to tea. They were very condescending to her, brusque and nasty about, he was nasty about the ability of the American military. His wife was nasty, scorning President Wilson for joining the Allies and absolutely scoffing at the idea that the Germans had lost the war? No way. Which was not an uncommon attitude in Germany. So there was that side of her life. And then she also had contacts with the socialists. And no, uh, socialized, socialized with the socialists. Because she needed all this information to send back to military intelligence. So she wasn't just adventurous, she was an enormous risk taker. Yes, yeah. for sure. She walked into Russia across the Polish border and she could have been shot rather than allowed in. Um, what was it about her that drove her to be so bold and to take her life into her hands so readily? There's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she admired her father and she was very close to her father. He was, I would say, a bit of an adventurer. Uh, he was a hugely successful businessman who turned the family chemical business into the Atlantic transport lines, of commercial, commercial shipping. And he loved to travel. So there was that. And in fact, every summer, the family would go to Europe. He would spend a month in England doing business and then go to ba the spa Baden-Baden in Germany and around, around the continent. And in fact, by the age of 10, Marguerite was the family translator. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, so I think she got that f the, f the, the love of travel and adventure from her father. Uh, also, she was not at all close to her mother, so you know, there, was, there was that too. Um, the courage, I guess he gave her a lot of confidence. That's because her mother did not. But um, her father gave her the confidence to just feel that if she understood what the danger was and could pro project what might happen, uh, and this was somebody else's explanation of it, uh, a, a filmmaker that she worked with, Marion Cooper. If she could understand the danger, then she didn't fear it. Hmm. Which is a good way to think about it, I think. Yeah. 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 So she spent a year in the infamous Lubyanka prison. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Because that was really... Well, it was, yeah. It was some time. pretty harrowing. Yeah. Uh, and I think the worst part of that was the time that she spent in solitary confinement. Yeah, that was, that was painful, but she was very strict with herself and uh, she had a, a routine that she would keep, a, a physical routine, a mental routine, uh, that just that kept her from panicking, kept her from, you know, really uh, just falling apart. But she also found it to be an, a, a wonderful experience because she met Russians from Russian women and Eastern European women. She was the only American in Lubyanka at the time. The only, uh, but she she loved their spirit, and she loved the Russian soul, the Russian culture. And so, and as you could tell from the, what, she, what, you, what you said before, the quote about her before, uh, she looked at everything with a very positive 
I. <laughs> she was always optimistic. And so she saw this as a great experience to get to know the real Russian people, whether they were aristocrats, which some of them were, or they were you know, prostitutes, because there were plenty of those also in prison then. And after Lubyanka, she then had to become a double agent, right? You're telling everything. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind, because we move on to the next <laughs> All right, we'll skip that one. <laughs> um, what do you think made her such an effective spy? Oh, I really think um, her intelligence, number one. But when she was a little girl, her governess said to her, you can have your intellect and use your intellect if you like, but you'll get a lot further if you use your charm. <laughs> and she did. And she did. So that was a big one. And then there were her abilities with language and getting along with people from every uh, spectrum in, in life. Do you want to maybe read a, f a few paragraphs from the book? OK. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I will. You mentioned her arriving in Russia. And she had. She had been, she had been sent to Europe, to, to Russia, again with the cover of a reporter, this time with the AP. But she stopped in London to pick up her credentials from the AP and then went to Switzerland, where she dropped off her son in boarding school, then went to Poland and made her way to the Polish-Russian border. The Poles and the Russians were still at war, even after the armistice. <coughs> a nervous Polish lieutenant led her through a maze of barbed wire fence, trying hard to dissuade her and warning that she would be shot at once if she stepped onto Russian turf. She shrugged in defiance, and standing at the edge of the unknown, she headed off toward the eerie passage of no man's land. Against a bitter wind and temperatures well below zero, she wrapped her doubts in her long fur coat and with a fur cap, fur-lined gloves, and high felt boots, she marched through the deadly silence crunching over snow-blanketed fields. Like Tolstoy's Prince Andre, she knew that one step beyond that line lay the unknown. And what was there? Who was there? Beyond this field, no one knew. She would like to know, was afraid to know, wanted so much to cross it. Sooner or later, she would have to cross it. She was aware that once she reached the Russian side, she would have no one to turn to for help. No American diplomats had stayed in the country. No foreign embassies remained to represent her. She had no way to send a message out and no one inside the country she knew to receive a message in. <coughs> she would be at the mercy of a dangerous adversary. Well, speaking about in information, um, how important was the information that Marguerite passed on to her American uh, handlers? What kind of impact did it have on national and international security? Um, and you, you write that she had given the military intelligence more information about Russia than any other agent. She did. She had phenomenal access to information about the Russian economy, of which we knew almost nothing. There were no Western diplomats. The Russians, the Bolsheviks, this was 19, 1920. Um, so the revolution was still fresh, very fresh. And the, the Bolsheviks would not let anyone into the country, no reporters, uh, 
no one who did not, who they were not sure of as uh, sympathetic to the cause, which is why Marguerite actually snuck in. She did not have permission to enter. So we needed information about their economy. We needed information about the, the state of the people, how they felt, who was actually in charge, who was running the country, what was the government, what did the government look like? And it was just being, just being formed when she was, when she was there. Uh, and uh, was there enough food? Were there severe shortages? What were the Russians willing to do if they needed food? What were they willing to do? Would they change their ways? We were very happy when, before the Bolsheviks revolted, we were very happy with the Kerensky revolution. So this came as kind of a shock to us, and what were we gonna do? And who was, who was in Russia who was going to infiltrate the United States and undermine our country. How, how far had they gone to try to upend our democracy? So, a, lot, a lot at stake. A lot yeah. of, yeah. So uh, one thing that struck me was that we live in an age of instantaneous communication now, but in her day that was hardly the case. Yeah. Right. So how did Marguerite and spies of um, the time get messages sent and receive answers? Oh, it was everything from, as a, as a correspondent, theoretically, she could write reports and send them out, although the censorship was so high that very, very little actually got back to the countries that they were meant to go to. So she used everything. There were businessmen in Russia, and so she used some of them. There were some correspondents that got through uh, uh, because they were somewhat sympathetic to the Russian government, and she was able to, and some of them were not, they just were pretending. Uh, so she was able to give some of them secret messages, and she used everything from matchbook covers to um, paper money to um, whatever she could write on in the tiniest, tiniest uh, handwriting. And in, of course, with secret codes. Um, did Marguerite predict the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich? I'm sorry. Did Marguerite predict the rise of Hitler and, and the Third Reich? And, and if so, how was that prediction met by the American military intelligence? She actually did in, in 1919. She, in, in Berlin and around Germany and in, and in Poland and Lithuania, where she had been sent, she actually saw pogroms in Poland. She, she, was, she joined secret societies of the right wing and saw their pamphlets and their posters all around the city looking for members and saying how they were going to get rid of the Jews. Jews were not allowed in their societies, and they, they, Germany was, was at, the, at the danger, at danger if there were Jews. And she saw members of those societies marching, o older men in their army uniforms and young boys in caps and jackets with their necks stretched high and their uh, black boots goose-stepping, stomping their way, uh, marching their way to stomp out the Jews. She sent reports home, and some of the people in the American military just sloughed it off and said, can't, can't be, not true. But there were some who paid attention. Let's talk about uh, something a little more frivolous, fa fashion, <laughs> something that you know quite a lot about. Uh, Marguerite was always well turned out, regardless of whether she was sleeping in the desert or in, in a tent with tribespeople or on a horseback in a blizzard in Mongolia. 
I'm thinking about her silk stockings and her furs and her fur coat came in very handy from time to time. Yeah. Um, and she wrote about how in prison in Lubyanka she would find a way to keep her hair waved and try to look her best at all times. What did her appearance mean to her and do you think it was part of her charm offensive? Oh, I think it made her feel better. Uh, you know, she it gave her a, a more positive outlook when she, when she knew that she looked attractive. Uh, it mattered to her herself as much as it mattered to her about how other people saw her. But she cared very much how other people saw her. Yeah. yeah. And she did have a passion for clothes. I, I think as a child, even, her clothes were, were made in, in Paris. So, yeah. <laughs> so after she ceased being a spy, what did she do with the rest of, of her life? Well, she had been a spy. And as we know, many spies just sort of fade away. Um, and so she... She had, a, she had a good life to some, to some extent, but her, the, the fame that she had, and she did have some while she was, while she was at the height of her career, um, just kind of quieted down. And like Smiley and the others, um, she just sort of faded off. <laughs> So you write about women in history, and many of your subjects are not well known until you bring their stories to life. I'm thinking not only of Marguerite, but also about Gertrude Bell, and they met, actually, right, yes. and, um, and Hedy Green. How do you discover these women? Well, I think what's fun is I, I, Gertrude Bell I discovered because after my late husband and I wrote a book about Arafat, a biography of Arafat, called Arafat in the Eyes of the Beholder. So it was looking at him from all sides. I was so frustrated, is the word, by not being able to really understand him as a human being that I decided I wanted to write about a woman, because surely I'd be able to understand a woman better. But I couldn't find, outside of Golda Meir and Cleopatra, I could not find an important woman in the Middle East. And then when Saddam Hussein broke the borders and went into, into Kuwait, I saw a small article in a newspaper blaming those borders on a British woman. And so that's what led me to Gertrude Bell. When I was doing research about Gertrude Bell at the University Library in Newcastle, England, she wrote home to her father saying that an, a, an extraordinary American woman had come through town. This was 1924. And I thought to myself, what was an American woman doing in Baghdad in 1924? She must have been extraordinary to be there, but why? What had she done? And it took me years, because this was not, that was 93, and I didn't really find out a whole lot of information about Marguerite Harrison until about five or six years ago. So. Should we open up the floor for questions? Sure. Yes, Eric. Eric. Uh, a question about um, your research. You, um, the way you t talk about her is so intimate. Did she leave diaries that would... How I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so yeah. Anyway, I'm just curious where you got the, the, that sense of her bigger life right. and right. personality and stuff like that. Right. And along with that question, uh, did you have uh, to go deep into, you know, government files and stuff to, and Freedom of Information Act and all of that to get at a lot of that stuff? I did. Um, about the diaries, she, she, may, she may have kept diaries, I don't think so, but she did write letters home which were destroyed by her daughter-in-law. Uh, 
But she also wrote an autobiography. So that gave me a whole, you know, the whole overview of her life. Uh, yeah, it also raised as many questions as it answered because she was a spy. So there were lots of sort of not blank pages, but you know, unwritten parts of her life. The best thing was the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, because I was able to find out that there were papers, and I spent a long time at the National Archives in Washington. And that was fascinating, because um, it wasn't just her papers, but it was papers about her. And the cables that she sent home were of two classifications. One were positive intelligence, which meant the activities going on in the countries where she was sent, what was happening inside that country. The other part of it were cables sent to negative intelligence, which is counterintelligence, and that's about people who might be trying to undermine the US. So that alone was fascinating. But then there were all the, the reports that she wrote and then the remarks that were made about her from military attaches and, and other people around the world. Uh, positive and you know, some snarky, some very complimentary. So that, that was great. I mean, that was thrilling, really, yeah. And then I found uh, archives in Moscow from the Cheka files. The Cheka was the predecessor to the KGB. And these were word for word transcriptions of the interrogations with her in Lubyanka. So, yeah. 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 So it's as much fun, of course, to do the research as it is to do, maybe even more fun to do the research than the pain of writing, but. <laughs> when did she stop being a spy? How close into World War II? I have two questions, that's one of them. Okay, so. So did she have a lot to do with pre-Hitler, I mean, it sounds like World War I, Did she, how far into the 30s was she still a spy? She was in Europe until the mid-30s. In fact, she, she wrote her autobiography with a dateline of Morocco in 1935. And then soon after that, she came back to the US because it was, she knew it was not Time a good to place out. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more quick question. Was she a precursor to many of the other spies that came around in the 30s? Because I've read about many of them in France, I'm sure. in Britain. I'm sure. She was the first American was woman she the first? sent overseas. And aristocratic, which seems to be a exactly. pattern. Right. So how would you categorize that? I mean, or why would there be this impulse for these privileged women to take these risks? Well, I think, first of all, um, they had the... Well, they had the educational background, so that was important. They had, many of them had probably spent time overseas, mm -hmm. so they were familiar with it, they were comfortable with it, you know, and, and they came, as you said, they came from that class, and so um, they were accepted by the, by the men who were from the same class, right, yeah. Uh, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask about uh, the being arrested in Russia. She was arrested simply because she went into the country without permission. And the Lubyanka years, I mean, the year in Lubyanka, I mean, they, yeah. sort of doing her hair. I mean, I know she came out sick, so I wonder if you could say a little more about what you know about Lubyanka, because it's a pretty awful place. It even. is an awful place, and she was tortured psychologically, if not physically. She never, she never went beyond her, her well, th there was definite psychological torture in, Luke, in Lubyanka. Um, she, she did have friendships and to some extent, you know, she was able to find a way to make it as pleasant as she could but it was a terrible experience, and terrible physically. Uh, and while she was there, she developed tuberculosis, 
and actually lost a lung. Now, the extraordinary part of that is that she was a chain smoker all her life, and she died at the age of 89. So, <laughs> this was a strong woman. <laughs> but the question was, what was she arrested for? And what, she, she was arrested theoretically for sneaking into Russia. But they had, there was somebody in the American government who was a double agent. And they had found out about her and knew far more than she ever dreamed of. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about your, that's me. Okay, yeah. A question about your research. Since you read transcripts of her interrogation in Lublyanka and the Russian, so those, those mountains of material are not in English. No. So how, <laughs> do you have everything translated unless you speak all Croatian and Russian and Polish? No, 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 no. I So have, yeah. you have mountains of information to be translated before you pick what you need. Well, there weren't, I wish there were mountains. Um, <laughs> there were pages, there were many pages. And I did, I was very fortunate to have a Russian uh, researcher who, who f was able to get into the, the archives and uh, translate the, f the files for me. Yeah, yeah. But most of, most of my research, 95% of my research was in English because she was American and so, yeah, yeah. But researchers can be invaluable, especially something like that. Yeah. Um, I have a shallow question. Um, it's about the clothes and I want to know, how did she manage all of this? Did she have like a lady's maid to help her with things and did she have trunks and clothes and how did no, she get them from place Bell. to place? <laughs> <laughs> Or was she just have a khaki outfit that she would wear all the time? Or you, it sounds like you she was it. a bit of a clothes horse. You got it. She had one khaki outfit okay. that she went to prison. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And she had to wash out her laundry all the time. <laughs> Somebody in the back there. <laughs> um, in your research of all these women who made contributions to history, did you find a theme uh, that uh, the male-dominated structure in some ways constricted their abilities and their voice so that we didn't really know of them? Was, and was there any particular segment of the governments or the society that this theme uh, permeated? Uh, I would say probably in all, in all parts, and to give you an example, at, after, at, in 1924, 20, Marguerite Harrison was in Persia making a film, a documentary film about a nomadic tribe. And she made the film with somebody she had met in Moscow who later became the filmmaker of King Kong. But he was totally unknown when they worked together in Persia. When they came back to the United States and the, and the film was shown, it was a silent movie. When it was shown, it was very successful. It was very well received. He was invited to speak at the Explorers Club. She wasn't allowed in. So that, you know, I think that's kind of typical of what happened, yeah. But the people she worked for respected her because she did a great job, mm -hmm. so that's important. That's, yeah. um, were you able to interview her son and what became of him? I, her son died a long time ago, so no, I was not able to. Um, he was a, a, a businessman, uh, and he, he always had a, he was, I actually spent time with 
her granddaughter and her great-granddaughter. And they were very helpful. Her son was a very kind and symp simpatico person who never showed his anger toward his mother. But he became an alcoholic. So he carried that around. And as his granddaughter said, he was a real, he was a, 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 a real alcoholic. I mean, nice as could be during the day, and then just fall down dead drunk at night. Not abusive, but that's what, that's what happened to him. Yeah. But his granddaughters were terrific. So, yeah. This is a straightforward question. At what age did she leave her son? Uh, he, how old was he? Yes. Yeah, he was, um, I'm trying to think, 19, 1902, 19. He was 17. He was, seven, he was 17. So he wasn't a baby. He wasn't a baby. He was a teenager. Yeah. And he was left really in the care of his, he may have been 16, but he was an adolescent. Um, he was left in the care of his grandparents. So. Fascinating book, and thank you for sharing with thank us you. all. I have a question. Is this a possible um, series? Because there are so many women that during wartime have been um, very good at researching and being spies, although they do stand out, so they have to be particularly um, careful. But I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of, historically speaking, other women that were spies. That Have you done other research about other women that are spies? And is this a possible movie? Or uh, Oh, I think so. Yes, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> so, just curious. Thank you. The Life of Gertrude Bell is a film. Yeah, but not based on my book. <laughs> the truth. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Okay. This would make a great film. Yeah. Eric. I'm, a, I'm just curious. Uh, you said she faded. Was she accepted back into society? She didn't want to be society that way. And, and she had done two things earlier in her life that she felt were very important and that she left kind of as a, a mark of her work. Um, one was, while she was a society matron, she started a, um, a school for children who were hospitalized and not able to attend regular school. And so the Children's Hospital School in Baltimore became an important institution. Yeah, so that was one, and now I'm trying to think of what to say. Oh, I know. Um, she and a few other women who suffered from being women, even though they were explorers and um, courageous women traveling all over the world, were not accepted, as I said, at the Explorers Club or any other club like that. So they started the Women's Geographical Society. And they had everybody from Margaret Mead to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt as members. So that was a very important. It still exists. It, that was very important. Yeah. yeah. I guess we'll have to read, read the book to find out about any really exciting, dangerous episodes oh, yeah. that she encountered. <laughs> But in order to make Much the movie. Much as I love you, Leila. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I don't want you to reveal them now. But um, I think it's amazing how you found out about this woman, because Gertrude Bell actually is very well known in the UK, but of course. Was it? Yes, in the and, UK. And right. uh, maybe not so much here. No. But it's amazing how you came across this woman. And I'm just wondering if there are any more, more sort of deep throat characters out there that we don't know about um, <laughs> I'm that sure you're going to find. I'm sure there are. Because it, it's amazing how both wars do seem to yield up more stories than we could ever make up or imagine. It just goes on and on and on. We find these amazing characters. Yeah. So yeah. she sounds to be one of them, which has been overlooked all this time. Right. That's true. Anyway. That's true. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in just thinking about Lila's question, it makes me uh, reflect upon your work as you have, you've discussed the books uh, that have featured lesser known women, but you have also written about women who were exceptionally well known like Coco Chanel and Queen Noor. So is there 
Is there any difference in the psychology and the conduct, the motivation between a woman like Coco Chanel who sort of does conquer the world and her name is still literally all over the world all the time and somebody who has to be revived and resuscitated from Russian archives? Well, first of all, it was the nature of her work. You know, Chanel was a genius at what she did. I remember doing the research on Chanel and going to museums in, not in New York, in Paris, in London, and looking at the original clothes and feeling like I could put on any of those dresses and walk out the door. I know they were still so stylish and so beautifully done. So that's a, it's a very different area. Uh, and I th think she made it her business to be you know, an institution, whereas I think Gertrude Bell, well, Gertrude Bell did to some extent. Her big aim initially was to be a person with a capital P. Yeah, and she talked about that all the time in her diaries and in her letters. So in some ways, yes, she was, and she was well known in, in England, although not around the rest of the world after it now. Um, and I don't think that Marguerite Harrison had any real interest in that kind of fame. She wrote several books, she wrote five books, but they were more academic than they were popular kind of literature. So they were different, different people. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you uh, started writing and when did you start to write? What age? Well, I had always wanted to write and I majored in nonfiction writing in, uh, in college. And then of course I couldn't get a job. Uh, because I'm a woman. Um, you could get a job as a secretary, but not as a writer. And so I went into my other area of interest, which was fashion. Uh, and <laughs> I became a designer, and then when I married John, moved to Washington and uh, worked for a major store called Garfinkel's. I was the fashion director at Garfinkel's. And and I had been a designer in New York for a number of years. When I was at Garfinkel's, we had a retreat and it, for top executives in the store. And the theme of the retreat was how to manage people. And on day one or day two, they gave us a workbook. And one of the first questions that we were supposed to answer in the workbook was, what would you like written as your epitaph? And without giving it a whole lot of thought, I wrote, she was a fine writer. And I realized, <laughs> I don't care about managing people. What I really care about is writing. And so that's what got me writing. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. And thank you, Janet. <laughs> <laughs>